Hello, everybody. This is Greg Alexander. Welcome to the SBI Podcast. I'm excited about today's show because it has a CEO on it who knows a lot about revenue growth. Joining us today is Hassan El Khoury, and he's the CEO of Cyprus, the leader of the semiconductor industry. Hassan's mission is to establish Cyprus as the global supplier of choice for innovative products, for innovative companies, excuse me, in high growth markets. I was thrilled to read that last quarter, Cyprus experienced a 12% growth rate over the same period last year and is leading the industry in growth. They shifted from commodity products to high value sales efforts. And this has made it possible to focus on the even higher value offerings that they have in their product portfolio. In today's interview, Hassan will demonstrate how the CEO defines which markets you will compete in and which markets you shouldn't compete in. And he does a really good job of talking about taking a broad market segment, bringing it down into sub-segments, prioritizing the sub-segments that have the highest growth, and then one step further, within those high growth sub-segments, determining at the account level which accounts have the greatest potential and then assigning an executive sponsor to those accounts. And Hassan himself is one of those executive sponsors. So a great demonstration on how CEOs truly need to lead the sales effort. So stick around, pay attention to this one. I think you're going to enjoy it. From SBI's Executive Briefing Center in Dallas, Texas, the most watched and listened to content in B2B sales and marketing, it's the SBI Podcast with your host, Greg Alexander. Welcome to the SBI Podcast, a weekly broadcast dedicated to helping you make your number by getting your peers to share with you how they are making theirs. Today, we're going to demonstrate how to define which markets you will and will not compete in. So why this topic? Being in fast-growing markets is the largest driver of revenue growth. Least important is market share growth, yet many executive teams tend to focus most of their attention on gaining share in their existing markets. While it is necessary to maintain and sometimes increase market share, changing your company's exposure to growing and shrinking market segments should be a major focus. My name is Greg Alexander. I'm the CEO of SBI, and I am your host. And joining me in the studio is my co-host, Melissa Valdez. And Melissa is here to point you to resources to advance you along the way of making your number. So, Melissa, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Greg. Welcome to our listeners. All right. And helping Melissa and I today with our demonstration is an executive who knows a lot about this topic. His name is Hassan El Khoury, and he is the Chief Executive Officer of Cypress Semiconductor. Hassan, welcome to the show, and please introduce yourself to the audience. Thanks, Greg. Uh, so like I said, Hassan al Um I'm the CEO of Cyprus. Uh, the topic you brought up is uh, a very important one for us. We are in a highly competitive uh, market. You can't just go uh, after share. You have to really strategically position yourself. I've been in the position for about a year, and we've gone through a, a transformation and an evolution to go from you know, a legacy way of selling to the new way, which we'll talk about. Yep. And for the audience's benefit that might not be familiar with Cyprus, give us a feel for um, what your company does, maybe a feel for scope of the company, et cetera. Absolutely. So we're, uh, we're about a $2 billion company uh, run rate uh, in revenue, about $4.5 billion of uh, market share or uh, market cap. And uh, we're exposed to a lot of the markets. We are a semiconductor uh, solutions provider, uh, broad, what I mean broad, both in product, but also in customer. So our uh, exposure to customer is uh, uh, very broad, about 30,000 customers. But we do have efforts of uh, selling to high key uh, leaders in their area. When I talk about semiconductor products, we go from microcontrollers, connectivity, Wi-Fi, uh, Bluetooth, uh, memory products, and more importantly, we are moving to uh, a lot of the software that goes along with these products. So it's a broad exposure of products, broad exposure of markets, and broad exposure of customers, which makes either the opportunity or the complexity of it uh, a little challenging. And you do business across the globe in roughly how many employees? Uh, we got about 6,500 employees, uh, but yeah, we're a worldwide supplier. Uh, Pretty well distributed as far as design and uh, creation, design creation, uh, demand creation uh, over the, the globe. Yep. Uh, more obviously, when you talk about revenue generation, is more exposed to China, 
uh, just because of the fact where manufacturing is. Yeah. Uh, we are one of the very few companies remaining that still have uh, manufacturing. We're not fabless. Uh, we have our uh, uh, semiconductor manufacturing fab uh, actually in the U.S., uh, one of the very few companies uh, remaining, uh, as well as we do a lot of our assembly uh, in-house. Yeah. President Trump would be a big fan of yours. <laughs> U.S.-based manufacturing. <laughs> All right, uh, Melissa, I'm going to use our methodology that is outlined in the How to Make a Number in 2018 workbook. The audience might want to follow along. Can you tell them how to do so? Yes, absolutely. We are in the corporate strategy section, phase one markets on page 48. All right, very good. And they can get a copy of that by going? They can go to sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook. All right, very good. All right, so let's jump into the questions here. So to give the members of the audience some context for the competitive market that you operate in, let's begin with an overview. So how big is the overall addressable market? Our uh, overall addressable market is about uh, 27 billion, and that's what we call you know, our T1 TAM, which is you know, a step higher than what we call the serviceable market. It's the market that is available to us whether we choose or not. Uh, so 27 billion obviously is a big number to look at when you're broad. Then the question is, how do you focus? <laughs> yeah, and that was my next question. So this $27 billion market, is it growing? Is it shrinking? And within that, what is your sweet spot within that addressable market? Sure. So uh, let me just walk you briefly about the, the thought process. So when you look at the, at the market, uh, there are a lot of sub-markets. And mm -hmm. your standard uh, sub-markets are you know, automotive, industrial, consumer, mobile, et cetera. That overall market is growing. And I'm going to give you the five-year number, you know, the 17 to 21, uh, 2017 to 2021, between 1% and 2%, you know, to be specific, about 1.8%. Now, if I look at it, that's not really a stellar growth. If you look at, you know, overall semi or so on growing uh, at the rate of, if we're lucky, you know, three to four percent, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Okay. So your expectations is to grow about twice the rate of the market. Is that correct? No. Uh, the answer is the semi market overall. Our market is one point eight percent. What we have set out to do is actually outgrow the market. And the last, what I outlined for Cyprus growth is specifically seven to 9%. I see. Which is a much higher growth rate. Yeah, it is a much higher growth rate. So let me ask you about that. I mean, I, I love talking to CEOs that are growth focused CEOs. I mean, you're trying to grow at uh, a much faster rate than the overall market. So what's the secret sauce there? Is this gonna be taking share? Is this gonna be uh, out innovating? Is this gonna be exposing yourself to new markets? I mean. What's the what's the foundational element of your strategy? It's actually all of the above uh, because it depends on on the approach. Uh, the way I've approached it, uh, part of our our new go to market uh, planning that we've done, is you look at the market growing, let's say two percent. Then you look at what segments in that, what are sub markets that are growing faster than that. Mm -hmm. So if you obviously it's it's very, you know, easy to say if I want to grow faster, I have to play in the sub-markets that are faster. For us, those are auto, uh, automotive, those are industrial and consumer. So you're not gonna hear me talking about, you know, we're gonna take over the mobile world. Yeah. You're not gonna hear me talking about, you know, other, you know, communications and infrastructure. So we narrowed the focus to three. Once you have those three, now even that, you have to take it a drill down. So back on the focusing on growth, you have to understand your market. It seems very reasonable or very, not challenging, but it's anything but because that requires a complete focus organizationally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very hard to tell your sales guys or even your marketing. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, don't go there, go here yeah. when they see the next shiny object, yeah. right? Uh, so that comes with understanding the market and the opportunity. But back to your question, then how do you get it? You have to be able to take share mm -hmm. through technology and innovation mm -hmm. because, you know, if I only look at growth, it's not easy to take growth, but it's hard to take growth that is highly profitable. Yeah. Therefore, you have to have innovation in the market while you take share. Yeah. And one, one piece of advice I'll give you know, mm -hmm. my peers is if you want to outgrow and aggressively outgrow, it's not only 
the category of these markets in units, but it's the content. Mm. Uh, and I'll highlight a few examples of those as we as we go through. Okay. So we're, we're talking to the CEO of Cyprus, uh, a $2 billion um, annual revenue, 6,500 employees, semiconductor company. And the topic today is determining which markets to compete in, which ones not to compete in. And the kind of the thesis of the call here is that exposing your company to fast growing markets is a, um, the easiest way or the high, highest probability of success way of growing. And what we just learned here by listening to Hassan is he's in this really large $27 billion market. And the growth of that market is, you know, one, two, maybe three percent. But he's been intelligent enough to break that market down into sub subsegments that have higher growth characteristics. And he pointed out three of them: auto, industrial, and consumer. And that's the whole idea here: is to how to prioritize high growth markets. I wanted to ask you: you specifically left out mobile, and uh, I think I'm surprised at that because at least my uneducated understanding of that market is that's a fast-growing area. And part of this show is helping audience members determine what markets not to compete in. So tell me a little bit about your rationale for staying away from mobile. Sure. It uh, really uh, depends on the DNA of the company. I look at it as cyclicality. Uh, uh, mobile is highly cyclical. Uh, the rate at which it happens is very short. So you talk about six-month cycle. Uh, when you are a long-view uh, company, uh, you know, when I look at my planning for a five-year, that require that is really a lot of fluctuation. What it means, it also provides a distraction. If you have, you know, markets like automotive and industrial, where design in that you do throughout this year are not going to generate revenue or growth for you know two years out. So, understanding the DNA that you have in the company and really what your long-term vision uh, makes it. Uh, clearer of what to play and what not to play and not get sucked into, you know, the math of big numbers, right? Because like you said, big numbers are attractive, high growth are attractive, but how well are you aligned to those? Is it natural for your company to go in and compete or do you pref or is it more longer term? Therefore, you have to align yourself to, you know, non-traditional high growth. Yeah. You know, it's a good reminder. You know, we all learned in school the whole concept of a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And a quick refresher course for the audience members, what you want to do is you want to match your strengths to the opportunities. And uh, Hassan just pointed that out for us. He talks about his company's DNA. What they're really good at, potentially the best in the world at, lines up really nicely with auto, industrial, and consumer. The mobile market, although attractive, is not part of his company's DNA, and that's okay. You can't be all things to all people. You gotta really understand what you're good at and match up those core competencies or your company's DNA to what the best opportunities are. So that's a great reminder for all of us to think through which markets to compete in and which ones not to. All right, this is probably a good time for a break. So, Melissa, many of the people that are listening to this are gonna want to read some more about it, maybe um, assess their own abilities against some of these emerging best practices with, you know, with what they're hearing from Hassan today. So can you tell the audience how they might leverage some of the tools that we have to try to put some of this into practice? So we have a brand new fantastic tool called the Revenue Growth Diagnostic. It's available at sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook. There you'll actually see three options. I mentioned you could get the workbook there, but the first option is to take this revenue growth diagnostic tool, and we definitely recommend that you do that first. It's a great tool. Every question actually asks you to rank yourself on a scale of one to five with how well you're performing in that particular area and how important it is to you. And the output of that is sort of a roadmap, if you will, to help you increase the probability of you making the number. Yeah, you know, we're talking about prioritizing today, and what's great about that tool is it takes this big concept of a go-to-market strategy, which could be many, many, many things to many people, and by going through this short self-assessment diagnostic, 10, 15 minutes of your time, you can narrow it down to the things that are most important to you. So I encourage all the listeners to go ahead and take the revenue growth diagnostic. And again, you can get that at um, sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook. Okay, let's jump into segment two here with Hassan. And let me ask you my next question, which is, so I got a, a good understanding of the markets that you're going to compete in and the ones you're not and the rationale behind that. Now we got to think about routes to market. So what are the traditional routes to market in this space and a second follow-up question to that would be, are there any innovative routes to market in these markets? Uh, sure. Obviously, you know, you have your, your traditional direct sales force 
Uh, you have a lot of the channel partners, uh, whether it's distribution or reps, uh, you know, system, subsystem uh, integrators, uh, module partners, et cetera. Uh, I can tell you it's not one size fits all. Mm. Uh, you have to understand really the customer. Uh, your customer base is really what's going to define how you go to market, uh, whether you're comfortable with it or not. Uh, mm. At the end of the day, uh, we're solving problems for customers. That's why they use our products and solutions. Uh, so what we've done, uh, we've tiered our customers uh, by you know key and strategic work we've done with, uh, with SBI. Mm -hmm. Uh, we still use it. It's a great approach to go to market. And then you align those customer categories with your traditional channels. Mm -hmm. You know, key account, uh, you have to have direct sales force, but you have to have uh, corporate engagement. I can tell you to this day, I am still an executive sponsor for one of the customers. Uh, although I took uh, on the role of CEO, I maintained that. Good for uh, you. It's a pulse that I have. Uh, so that now... When you start going broader, then you have to go distribution. What I would invite everybody to really focus on is uh, what's the cost of uh, a customer uh, uh, to get the customer, right? And based on that return that you will get from the customer, that acquisition cost has to be mapped to that return. It's a very hard metric to get, especially when you know the sales force is excited about a new customer or about an opportunity versus what the opportunity of it is to capture that customer. And more importantly, is the opportunity loss. Yeah. While you're doing that, what are you not doing? Because you can't do everything and be successful. Otherwise, you'll fail at a lot of things. I'd rather, you know, be successful as one big thing than fail at 10 different things. Yeah. So that's a very different you know, kind of a, a healthy tension between the sales force and really management product line and even the CEO. And you have to be able to drill in and put your bets where you feel comfortable to align the company to. Yeah, you know, I just, I love your answer on so many dimensions. So, and, I, and so I wanted to recap what I heard from you for the benefit of the audience and maybe emphasize a few critical points. So we mm -hmm. were having a conversation with the CEO of a large public company, a leader in his uh, industry. And we're talking about which markets to compete in and which ones not. And we've identified some prioritized markets. But Hassan didn't stop there. He then thought about the go-to-market model. And he said, okay, well, even within that sub-market, I've got to tier the customers that I'm going after. And then I have to match my sales channel to the tier. So, for example, kind of my tier one accounts and my key or strategic accounts, I probably want to invest heavily there. And I might be willing to have a higher customer acquisition cost there because the lifetime value of that customer, the revenue and profit that customer will give me over time warrants it. You know, the return characteristics of each of those accounts make investing in a higher cost of acquisition worth it. And then there's a tier below that and a tier below that and a tier below that. So you can kind of slot in your sales channels and your coverage model based on the economic profile of each segment. The reason why I want to emphasize this is that it's not enough to stop at the market segment. So if Hassan just said the automobile market, that's too broad. Within the market, you have to identify down at the account level, you know, what the economic profile is with, it, with each account and therefore what the proper uh, sales channel should be with each account. So it's just an excellent job of what you guys have done here, and it's probably the reason why you're doing so well these days. So I just wanted to emphasize kind of the academic rigor behind that that you deployed. I do have a follow-up question on this, and, and I'm not sure if it applies to you, but we have seen in some industries the rise of the e-commerce channel, um, which is typically in a B2B setting, you know, you wouldn't think that e-commerce would have a role. That's more of a consumer type of sales channel. But we're seeing Amazon.com, as an example, push themselves into you know, traditionally B2B markets with this e-commerce channel. Are you seeing that in your industry, Hassan? Uh, we do see it, but not, uh, you know, we see it through our uh, channel partners. Okay. Uh, not directly. Obviously, we, we do a little bit uh, as far as, you know, I'd call it an e-store uh, for customers to sample, to have kits, to more on the enablement side uh, mm -hmm. rather than uh, purely fulfillment. Uh, fulfillment, you know, in our manufacturing, in our industry, there's a lot of uh, things that uh, not prevent you from doing it, but these are things you don't want to distract yourself doing. Yeah. They're not problems that you can't overcome, 
they're just opportunities that you know somebody else is better suited to do yeah uh, so we leave those to to our partners uh, they're very well uh, aligned to doing that and they're more call it lean as far as being able to address 30,000 customers that are equaling 30,000 different requirements yeah. versus us taking on that burden yeah. while we focus on really what matters to us, which is our core competency. Yeah. So a little how-to advi advice for the CEOs that might be listening. So you've got your prior prioritized mm -hmm. markets. You've got within those markets to prioritize accounts using a tiering structure. And now you've got, you're going to map your sales channel based on the economics of customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime value. When you get to mapping the sales channel, I would encourage you, and this is where innovation may hit you, to really throw a wide net. So some channels to consider. Obviously, you've got your direct field sales force, which is typically the most effective, but also the most costly. You've got inside sales. So those are people that sell over the telephone or, or on the web. You've got global account management, which is um, a version of a direct field sales force, a little bit more costly, but also a little bit more skilled. You've got your key account management team. So these are you know, maybe the best of the best of accounts and you want to treat them in a certain way. Value-added resellers, systems integrators. I just talked about the e-commerce channel, which although that doesn't apply here in semiconductors, it may apply to you. The point in me rattling off all these different sales channels is really when you're thinking about this, audience members, throw a wide net and at least once a year um, experiment or consider some channels that maybe you haven't experimented with. Because what I have found, at least in my uh, client base is that product innovation is essential for sure, especially in a technology industry category that Hassan is in. But there's more ways to innovate other than just product. You can innovate in your business model, you can innovate in your revenue model, and you can innovate in your sales channel. And I think sometimes that's a lever that, um, that isn't pulled as often. All right, enough of me preaching. It's probably a good time for another break. We'll come back with Hassan for our third segment. Melissa, some of the people that are listening, watching, and eventually will read this are probably going to want to emulate some of Hassan's behavior, and they may need some help. So can you tell the audience how we might help them with that? Yes, absolutely. You don't have to go at it alone. You have a team of experts here at SBI. We'd be happy to help you. I encourage you to think about an interactive workshop with one of our subject matter experts. And if you're wondering about that, you can go to that link, sbi.tips forward slash 2018 workbook, and any of the three options there, you can download the workbook, you can order a copy, or you can take the revenue diagnostic tool. We'll get your information and we'll connect with you. Yep, and in these workshops, again, led by a subject matter expert, we would ask you questions similar to the ones we're asking Hassan right now, plus a lot more. I mean, we have a 30-minute session with Hassan. We want to respect his time. If you came to Dallas in our executive briefing center and we put you through a workshop, it's typically an all-day event, and you would leave uh, that session with um, you know, a plan to go execute again. So if this is a topic that's interesting to you and you do want some help on it, consider coming to see us in Dallas. All right, let's come back to Hassan here in segment three, and we're talking about defining which markets to compete in and which ones not to compete in. We've had an interesting dialogue so far. Asan, the next topic I want to introduce to the audience here is this concept of demand drivers. So the things that are happening kind of in the macro environment that are creating demand for your products and services and how that needs to be an input into uh, determining which markets to compete in and which ones not to. You know, I've been following your company since you've been a client now for a number of years, and the whole industry, the semiconductor industry, which I know is, is too broad right now, um, is going through a tremendous growth spurt. It seems like there's all kinds of um, demand drivers like Internet of Things. Um, I, I just got a new Cadillac, and every time I'm not paying attention, my seat vibrates. Like There's all of these new things that are creating <laughs> demand for your products. So tell the audience a little bit about what's causing demand in your industry, how you're paying attention to that demand, and how that's informing your strategy. Uh, that's that's a very good uh, good point, especially on the car, because we're involved in a, a lot of automotive. About 30% of our revenue comes from uh, the automotive market. Wow. Uh, that's actually my background. I okay. came from the auto industry. So you're causing uh, my seat to vibrate. Than, than, <laughs> than the semi-conductor uh, industry. Uh, but there are a lot of factors, uh, and they differ by uh, segment or by market. Uh, let me take them quickly one at a time. Uh, you mentioned IoT or Internet of Things. Uh, to me, Internet of Things is probably the broadest and most widely used term lately. Uh, uh, you know, it's kind of 
the margin is on uh, is it marketing? Is it real market? Is it not? The way I look at IoT is a capability. Uh, it allows traditional systems to do something they did not do in the past, and that capability is connectivity. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, when a car gets connected to the internet, it doesn't move from the automotive market into whatever IoT market is. Therefore, the IoT capability uh, spreads across all of them. Uh, so what's driving that is connectivity, the availability of data, and why it's taken off now is because that accessibility to that technology, whether the connection or the processing of data, which is happening on the cloud or locally, that wasn't uh, accessible to a lot of companies before. You know, it used to be maybe enterprise. Now, somebody in their garage who's got an idea can get a kit, connect to the cloud, and all of a sudden you got a connected node that you can do whatever you want with. Uh, that is driving a lot more content. So even if you sell the exact same number of widgets per year, now you have more content per box on the bill of material, mm -hmm. which is driving demand for us. Mm -hmm. So understanding per market what the driver is, and in this case is connectivity, drives your strategic intent for the company. We went as far as understanding that market because we play with the microcontroller and we actually went on to acquire a company to provide the connectivity. And why is that important is while you are fully still aligned with your market, think about the sales efficiency you gained. And what I like to explain either to my staff or even to the sales force is the salesperson's route will not change. Now they have more things in their bag to give. And that is very important because then you just subsidized all the acquisition costs for customers and you maximize content creation within those accounts. I don't have to go acquire more customers and worry about you know acquisition costs and everything. I'm maximizing the exposure on a route that's already been done. And that's a nuance of you might see an attractive target, you might see an attractive technology, but if it will cause you to disrupt your sales force or you know hire a brand new sales force or expand that footprint you have to think more about it versus an opportunity to maximize content on an existing footprint. Mm -hmm. And those are nuances you have to get if you understand the driver for the growth versus just unit growth. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great answer and a great uh, example. Um, let me take the other side of the argument for a moment and play devil's advocate. What I hear from my clients, those mm -hmm. that want to um, put another product in the bag of the salesperson and say, hey, my salesperson is calling on you know, Joe Blow at XYZ Company, and right now he's got one thing to sell. If I put two or three additional products in his bag, he's still making that same sales call, but he now has more to talk to that customer about. So my, my uh, customer acquisition cost goes up marginally, not a lot, because I don't have to hire additional salespeople, and I'm giving that salesperson an opportunity to sell a lot more. Here's the challenge with that. If I'm a salesperson, and I'm selling product A, I'm dedicating 100% of my time to selling product A. And then you drop product B in my bag. I've got to dedicate some of my time to product B. Let's just say, I don't know, it's 20%. Where's that time going to come from? That's going to come from the time I was spent selling product A. So if not handled correctly, if I drop another product in the salesperson's bag, the core product that salesperson is selling right now may see a sales decline because I'm now focused on another product. Now, if the other product is, if I'm gonna sell so much of it that it far exceeds any possible degradation to the core product, then it's worth it. But we've gotta figure out if that's really going to happen or not. So this whole idea of a salesperson's mind share, you know, how many products can they represent well to a customer, is a tricky one, and it varies greatly by industry. My guess is you probably have thought about that. So what's your opinion here on, uh, on this dilemma of salesperson's mind share. Yeah, it absolutely is, uh, is a dilemma and you have to manage it carefully. And it's gonna depend based on the size of the account and the size of the opportunity. Uh, if both opportunities are large, both of the you know addressable market in that account are large, then you might have to put two mm -hmm. sales uh, people that are covering it. As long as both can sell the whole bag. Because mm -hmm. the failure mode for a company is you end up with smaller companies as far as the sales is exposed. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is actually wealth destruction. It is easy for a salesperson 
to comment on a capability or a new product that they have. They might not have to have a, you know, a whole meeting about it, but it's an awareness. It all starts with awareness to get the other meeting to happen with another salesperson. Yeah. And we focus a lot on cross selling. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of our products are selling into the same account due to awareness? But that's also important uh, with different markets. I'll give you an example. Uh, in automotive, you know, the cost of supplier acquisition is very high, not just customer acquisition, meaning the customer adding another supplier to their, uh, to their list. They have to, you know, monitor quality. They have to look at uh, manufacturing. They have to audit sites, which are not all local. You know, you have to go to the Philippines or China to look at manufacturing sites. You have to audit, you know, financial, et cetera. That is a very high cost for the customer to audit supplier. If you know that, then you know that it is a value proposition for you to be able to offer multiple products that solve that problem. Because then the customer is more likely to go with you across the whole bomb bill of material versus have to make five phone calls to get the same thing as long as at the base, the product is competitive. Yeah. So within every market, there are a lot of dynamics that you have to understand. And I'll give one, one great advice that I follow blindly uh, as far as me running uh, the company. Customer intimacy starts with the CEO. You can't delegate that. You have to have great marketing, great sales, great business unit. But a CEO has to be plugged in and has to have a pulse on the industry mm -hmm. and the customers. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And your example um, is one to follow in that you're still the executive sponsor and one of your key customers, which allows you to um, kind of walk the talk, so to speak. I mean, customer Absolutely. intimacy is so important that, that, uh, that you're playing that role. And my guess is you probably require your executive staff to do the same. Absolutely. I can tell you a quote I give in all hands meeting, everybody sells. <laughs> I love it. My <laughs> chief legal officer has an account that she's no responsible kidding. for. Wow. Everybody <laughs> on my staff has a assigned key or strategic account that they have to visit and they have to help. Uh, everybody's involved because every decision we make, even from a legal decision or a manufacturing decision, if you understand who's the recipient and that the customer matters and we care about the customer, you might make different trade-offs that will help the company without you, uh, you know, holding a sales back. Yeah. And that is very important for me. Fantastic. Right. <laughs> Listen, I could talk talk to you about this all day. Unfortunately, we're we're out of time here. We try to keep these uh, these interviews to less than thirty minutes. But listen, on behalf of our audience, uh, you added a lot to the conversation today. You're a great example on what a modern CEO needs to be thinking about, and being so customer focused and and supportive of the sales and marketing effort is a is a great thing for us all to see. So thanks a bunch for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Right. I enjoyed it. All right, we want, we want to thank the SBI audience for tuning in as well. Thank you for your continued support. I hope you got a lot out of today's show. And uh, because of your support, we're able to attract great guests like Hassan. So please uh, continue to support and tell everybody about our show, and we'll, and we'll keep going on this thing. Before we jump, Melissa, I think there's something else you want to share with the audience. My that instincts tell me that. One last thing <laughs> for my audience out there. Uh, we don't want you to miss out on all this fantastic content. So please go to salesbenchmarkindex.com forward slash register. There you'll create a My SBI account and you can select the topics of interest to you and when you want to receive content. We've got all kinds of good stuff out there. Yeah, don't very miss good. out. <laughs> so we produce two pieces of content a day, seven days a week, and we've been doing that for 10 years. So we've got a lot of content. We believe in educating our customer base and our future customer base, but it can be a little overwhelming. So if you create this account and you tell us the topics you're interested in and how often you want to receive them, we can customize it for you. All right, that's it for today. As always, until next time, I wish you good luck as you try and make your number. <laughs>